The Miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson. Chapter 7 Decision and Weakness. In recent years, the churches in enlightened centuries have devoted less attention to dissension than formerly. But in the rural districts and the small cities, they have not changed much. And neither in the urban communities nor in the countries has anyone succeeded in bringing these churches together to work for their general welfare. The militant sects are still fighting one another. And in addition to this, the members of these sects are contending among themselves. The spirit of Christ cannot dwell in such an atmosphere. Recent experience show that these dissensions are about as rank as ever. For example, a rural community in which his observers spent three weeks a year ago has no church at all, although eight and ten families live there. No church can thrive among them because, with one or two exceptions, each family represents a different denomination, and in the sectarian bias is so pronounced that one would not accept the procedure of the other. Each one loves his fellow man if he thinks as he does, but if his fellow man does not, he hates and shuns him. In another rural community where the same observer recently spent two weeks, he found a small and poorly attended Methodist church. Worshiping there one Sunday morning, he counted only four persons who lived in the community. Others might have come, for there was no other church for them in that place. But this particular church was not of their faith, and their number was too small to justify an establishment of one to their likening. The support given to the unfortunate pastor there is so meager they, that he can hardly afford to come to them once a month. And consequently, these peasants are practically without spiritual leadership. People who are so directed as to develop such as attitude are handicapped for life. Someone recently inquired as to why the religious schools do not teach the people how to tolerate differences of opinion and cooperate for the common good. This, however, is the thing which these institutions have refused to do. Religious schools have been established, but they are considered necessary to, apply, to supply workers for denominational outposts and to keep alive the sectarian bias by which the Baptists hope to outstrip the Methodists or the later uh, the former. No teacher in one of these schools has advanced a single thought which has become working principle of Christendom, and not one of these centuries is worthy of the same of the school of theology. If one would bring together all of the teachers in such schools and carefully sift them, he would not find in the whole group a sufficient number qualified to conduct one accredited school of religion. The large majority of, of them are engaged and important to the youth worn out theories of the ignorant oppressor. This lack of qualified teachers in Negro schools of theology, however, is not altogether the fault of the teachers themselves. It is due largely to the system to which they belong. Their schools of theology are impoverished by their unnecessary multiplication and consequently, the instructors are either poorly paid or not compensated at all. Many of them have to form, conduct enterprises, or pastor churches to make a living while trying to teach. Often, then, only the inefficient can be retained under such circumstances. Yet those who see how they have failed because of these things never the less object to unification of these churches as taught by Jesus of Nazareth, whom they all but cease to follow because of their sectarian bias obtained from thumb-worn books of misguided Americans and Europeans. <clears throat> Recently, the observer saw a resort of in the sermon of the Negro College graduate trying to preach to a church of the masses. He referred to all the great men in the history of the certain country to show how religious they were, whether they were or not. When he undertook to establish the Christian character of the Napoleon, however, however, several felt like leaving the place in disgust. The climax of the service was a prayer by another 
miseducated Negro, who devoted most of the time to thanking God for Sincereo and Demosthenes. Here, then, was an ease of the religion of the pagan handed down by the enslaver and segregationist to the Negro. Returning from the, the table where he had placed his offering in the church on Sunday morning, not long thereafter, this observer saw another striking example of this failure to hit the mark. He stopped to inquire of his friend, Jim Miner, as to why he had not responded to the appeal for a collection. What? said Jim. I ain't giving. That man nothing. That man ain't feed me this morning, and I ain't feeding him. This was Jim's reaction to the scholarly sermon entitled The Humiliation of the Incarceration. During the discourse to the ministers, he had had much to say about John Knox Orthodox and, and another of the communicates bowing at the shrine inquired of the observer later as to who this John Knox Orthodox was and where he lived. The observer could not answer all of the inquiries thus evoked, but he tried to explain the best he could that the speaker had studied history and theology. This was the effect of sermon had on the earnest congregation. The minister had attended a school of theology, but merely memorized words and phrases, which meant little to him and had nothing to those who heard his discourse. The school in which he had been trained followed the traditional course for ministers, devoting most of the time to the dead language and dead issues. He had given attention to polytheism, monotheism, and a doctrine of the, of the Trinity. He had studied also the physiological basis of the Caucasian dogma, the elements of the theology and the schism by which fanatics made religion of football and multiplied wars only to the most in the soil of Europe with the blood of unoffending men. This minister had given no attention to the religious background of the Negroes to whom he was trying to preach. He knew nothing of their spiritual endowment and their religious experience as influenced by their traditions and environment in which the religion of the Negro has developed and expressed himself. He did not see to know anything about their present situation. These honest people, therefore, knew nothing additional when he had finished his discourse. As one communicant can point out, their wants had not been supplied, and they wondered where they might go to hear a word which had some bearing upon the life which they had to live. Not long ago, when the author was in Virginia, he inquired about a man who was once popular preacher in that state. He is here, they said, but he is not preaching now. He went off to school. And when he came back to the people, could not understand what he was talking about. Then he began to find fault with the people because they would not come to the church. He called them foggy because people, because they did not appreciate his new style of preaching and, and the things he talked about. The church went down to nothing, and he finally left it and took up farming. In a rural community, then a preacher of this type must fail unless he organizes separately members of the popular Methodist and Baptist churches who got into a, the ritualistic churches or established certain refined Methodist or Baptist churches catering to the talented tenth. For lack of, an, of adequate numbers, however, such churches often fail to develop sufficient force to do very much for themselves or for anyone, anybody else. On Sunday morning, then the pastors have talked to the benches. While these truncated churches go higher in their own atmosphere of self-satisfaction, the mentality undeveloped are left to sing lower because of the lack of contact with the better trained. If the latter exercise a little more judgment, they will be able to influence these people for good by gradually introducing advanced ideas. Because highly educated people do not do this. Large number of Negroes drift into, drift into churches led by the uneducated ministers who can scarcely read and write. These preachers do not know much of what is found in school books. 
and can hardly make use of a librarian working out a sermon. But they understand the people with whom they deal. And they make such use of the human laboratory that sometimes they become experts in solving vexing problems and meeting social needs. They would be much better preachers if they could have attend a school devoted to the development of the mind rather than cramming it in the extractionist matters which have no bearing on the task which lies before them. Unfortunately, however, few, very few of such schools of religion now exist. For lack of intelligent guidance, then the Negro church often fulfills admissions to the contrary of that which it was established. Because the Negro church is such a free field and it is controlled largely by the Negroes themselves, it seems that practically all the incompetents and undesirables who have been barred from other walks of life by race, prejudice, and economic difficulties have rushed into the ministry for the exploitation of the people. Honest ministers who are trying to do their duty then find their tasks made difficult by these men who stoop to particularly everything conceivable. Almost anybody of the lowest type may get into the Negro ministry. The Methodists claim that they have strict regulations to prevent this, but, but their nets drawn in proportionately as many undesirable as one finds among the Baptists. As an evidence of the depths to which the uh, institution has gone, a resident of Cincinnati recently reported a case of exploitation by a railroad man who lost his job and later all his earnings in a game and a den of vice in that city. To refinance himself, he took an old black frock coat and a Bible and went into the heart of Tennessee, where he conducted at various points a series of distracted, protracted, meetings which needed him 299 converts to the fates of $400 in cash. He was enabled thereby to return the game in Cincinnati and he is still in the lead. Other such cases are frequently reported. The large majority of Negro preachers of today then are doing nothing more than to keep up the medieval hellfire scare which the whites have long since abandoned to emphasize the humanitarian trend in religion through systemized education. The young people of the Negro race could be held in the church by some such program, but the Negro Christianity does not conceive the social uplift as a duty of the church. And consequently, the Negro children have not been inadequately trained in religious matters to be equal to social demands upon them. Turning their back on medievalism, then these untrained youth think nothing think nothing of moon sh moonshining gambling think nothing taking up moonshining gambling and racketeering as, as occupation and they find great joy in smoking drinking and fornication as diversions they cannot accept the old ideas and they do not understand the new what the negro church is however has been determined largely by what the white man has taught the race by precept and example we must remember that the Negroes learned their religion from the early white Methodists and the Baptists who evangelized the slaves and the poor whites when they were barred from prosperizing and aristocracy. The American white people themselves taught Negroes to specialize unduly in the praise, the Lord, hallelujah worship. In the West Indies, among the Angelicans, Angelicans and among the Latin people, Negroes do not show such emotionalism. They are cold and conservative. Some of the American whites, moreover, are just as far behind in the respect as they, the Negroes who have less opportunity to learn better. While in Miami, Florida, not alone the founder of in two interracial holiness churches, that the following was a third or fourth white. The whites join wholeheartedly with the Negro in their holy rolling, and some of them seem to be rollers, not holy. A few months ago in Huntington, West Virginia, where the author was being entertained by friends, the party was disturbed throughout the evening by most insane outbursts of white worshipers in a church of God across the street. There they, are, they daily indulge in such whooping and screaming in unknown tongues that the Negroes have had to report them to the police as a nuisance. 
The author has made a careful study of the Negro church, but has never known Negroes to do anything to surpass the performance of those heathens. The American Negroes' ideas of morality, too, were borrowed from their owners. The Negroes could not be expected to raise a higher standard than their aristocratic governing class that teemed with sin and vice. This corrupt state of things do not easily pass away. <clears throat> The Negroes have never seen any striking examples among the whites to help them in matters of religion. Even during the col colonial period, the whites claimed that their ministers sent to the colonies by the Anglican Church, the pro pro progenitor of the Protestant e e Episcopal Church in America, were a degenerate class that exploited the people for money to waste it in racing horses and drinking liquor. Some of these ministers were known to have an illicit relations with women and therefore winked at the sins of the officers of the churches who sold their own offspring by slave women. Although the author was born 10 years after the Civil War, the morals and religion of that regime continued even into his time. Many of the rich or well-to-do white men belonging to the churches in Buckingham County, Virginia, indulged in polygamy. Polygamy. They raised one family by a white woman and another by a colored or poor white woman, both the owner of the largest slate quarry and the proprietor of the largest factory in the country lived in the fashion. One was an outstanding Episcopalian and the other was a distinguished Catholic. One day the foreman of the factory and the polygamous deacon of the local white Baptist church called the workmen together at noon for a short of memorial service in honor of Parsons Taylor for almost half a century the pastors of the Lord's White Baptist Church in the section. The four men made some remarks on the life of the distinguished minister, and then all sang, shall we, mount, shall we meet beyond the river? But to save his life, the author could not restrain himself from wondering all the time whether the four men's white wife or colored Paramore would greet him on the other side, and what a conflict there would be if they happened to get into an old-fashioned hair pulling. In spite of his libertine connections, however, this this foreman believed that he was a Christian, and when he died, he eulogies commended his soul to God. Some years later, when the Arthur was serving his six years apprenticeship in the West Virginia coal mines, he found at Nollingbird a very faithful very faithful vestryman of the white Episcopal church at that point. He was one of the most devout from the point of view of his co-workers. Yet privately, this man boasted of having participated in that most brutal lynching of the four Negroes who thus met the, their doom at the hands of an angry mob in Clinton Forge, Virginia in 1892. It is very clear then that if the Negroes got their conception of religious from slaveholders, libertines, and murderers, they may be something wrong about it, and it would not hurt to investigate it. It has been said that the Negroes do not connect morals with religion. The historian would like to know what race or nation does such a thing. Certainly the whites with whom the Negroes have come into con contact have not done so.